Okay, so I have touched you at various points. If I touch you there again, you tend to regress to the state of physiology that you were in when I touched you the first time. That's true when I've been with my hand on the shoulder of someone setting up a, a context. Um, what is this stuff about here? When I set up the context and now I start in breathing or clapping or whatever, or, and I hit the edge of the context. What's that evidence for? That's evidence for spatial anchoring. This space contains the stuff you put there, the images, sounds, etc. This space is not occupied, and so you wipe it out and clean it up. It's going to be there. Every time you walk into there, like, horses are amazing this way. Carmen's sort of a horse. She organizes things by location, in, in the sense of organizing things by location. All right, so another example of anchoring. Touching the unconscious signals. OK, this is an unconscious signal, and this is a confirmation. It's using an anchor, a touch, a repetitive touch that has now been defined to say thanks, associated with thanks. So all the spatial stuff we've done here, I mean, the thing that you did, I've never done that before. That was cool. Uh, the the like phobia thing. Oh, so phobia. Yeah, she's already forgotten about it. See? There's gratitude. Don't even remember my No, we now have so many times, so which one you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that was all spatial. And I was on him. I was stabilizing him at certain points. Um, so everything you do is an anchor. If you do it systematically, it has the effects you want. <coughs> Fortunately, most people, you know, do it sloppily. So the anchors never really get separated out cleanly with respect to the states. The chain of excellence, the breathing pattern, is your anchor. I mean, there's nothing more powerful than a specific breathing pattern. So if you're sitting there and you're feeling a little bit of so in through your nose, hold lungs full, out to the mouth, hold lungs empty. Do three cycles of that, you change your state. I mean, that, those are efficacious anchors. Those are anchors that make a difference. Now, anchors with other people. Uh, first of all, the whole thing depends on calibration. If you can't see the, and hear the differences or feel them if you're in physical contact, you can't anchor. What are you anchoring? You don't know. So, calibration is the key to anchoring. Once you have the ability to make the distinction, then it's all a question of timing. Anchoring is one of those inherently honest <coughs> activities in NLP. If I'm working with uh, B and I say, okay, tell me when, go back and enter into a time in martial arts when you were on the map and you were ready and you were in the middle of this encounter and you, you had it all, it was all there for you, blah, 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 and I'm doing a sort of half-assed hypnotic induction. And I see him start to adjust, and I say, tell me when you get there. I do that a lot, not because I wait for that, but because I'm curious what the light time between him getting there and him noting, noticing that he's gotten there is. And it runs about a half second for most people. So if my hand is resting on his shoulder as he's manipulating and going back and using synesthesia to put himself in a particular posture of his own and stuff like that, um, I, I will probably increase the pressure as I watch the changes and keep increasing it until they collapse up. Then I release. Then I know that the anchor is perfectly timed. And then a half a second later, you're going there. I'm already done. Because it happened a half a second ago. And the lag time in the consciousness is right about a half a second. So that's the sense in which it's inherently honest. You can't wait for the person to tell you they're there. And the easiest way to simplify that is a light touch or a certain physiology you're going to use visually or voice quality shift as you're talking to the person. So you, they're all dynamic. You could do multiples. Uh, staying with the touch. Okay. <coughs> touch is always work. If you have an anchor and you want to re-trigger the state that was anchored to it, and it's a distance anchor, a posture you use, if he's entertaining himself with images or talking to himself, he'll be at best half effective because the channels are full of stuff. So if you're using remote anchors, <coughs> anchors, getting 
get somebody's attention, interrupt what they're doing, get them to orient, then you do the, the visual or the auditory anchor. And it'll work, because you've cleared the channels by an interruption. If it's touching, you don't have to go through that extra step, because this is a survival issue. If you're touched, you orient. So that's the advantage of tactile anchoring. I think, of all the anchoring formats, the one I use is most is spatial. I associate places on the floor with states. Have people or even <coughs> walk them into it and make sure that it's an automatic. They're not thinking their way into it. There's no conscious left brain activity required. They associate, like the horse, a spot, a place, a location with a state. <coughs> by going into that location, they reactivate the state. Yes, please. Ask. Question for the touch. Um, I don't know if you're touching here, but you're touching there. Mm -hmm. So in which uh, situation, or it doesn't matter? I don't think so. Touch here, touch here. Touch behind your hand. I mean, in some sense, the weirder the better. <laughs> um, for those of you, the mentors especially, who are moving into a training room, um, I personally attempt, mostly, <laughs> to be transparent in what I'm doing. If I use tactile anchors, I anchor the problem, anchor the solution, or the state, smoke comes out of the arm, face, <laughs> all this stuff is going on. At the end of that, can he replicate it? It's not obvious. I put him in a folks, neutral or a third or something, and I have one part over here and one part over here. And this is the one he presently experiences, this is the one he wants. <coughs> then I give him a choice. I go, you're in the state. Tell that bugger to come over here. Call him over. Insist he come over to you. Or walk over and dominate this context, this situation over here, by carrying the state with you. So if I do that, so the first one is tactile anchoring, the second one is spatial anchoring. Which one's more transparent from the point of view of the client? And if it's a training event, from the observer's point of view, the special. So if I accept that part of my responsibility in training regimes like this is to behave as transparently as is I deem effective for whatever I'm chasing. Sometimes I don't want you to notice something, so I distract you. Sometimes I want to be totally transparent so you can replicate it. So it's an important way to think about that and the independence of your clients. If I'm doing all this tactical anchoring, it's hard for him or her to replicate. I set it up spatially, softly, carefully, take the time. They'll begin to replicate without even 